Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Zach on Sports. I am your host, Zach Gershman. Today I'm here at Temple University's McGonagall Hall with a very special guest. With me is the all-time winningest, big, winningest coach in Big Five history, one of only five coaches in NCAA history with at least 200 wins at two different Division I programs. And the man known as Mr. Big Five himself, Mr. Fran Dunphy. Welcome, Coach. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate you having me on your, your show. I, I thank you for, for allowing me to interview you. Amongst many other accolades, Coach is one of the leaders in the local Coaches vs. Cancer campaign. He was also named on the National Council of the Coaches vs. Cancer uh, Society of Coaches vs. Cancer campaign. And Coach is a two-time winner of the American Athletic Conference Coach of the Year Award. Coach, you've been in the Big Five for a little over six decades now. You, you were a star athlete under the great Tom Gole at LaSalle, went to Villanova for your Masters, went to Penn, coached there for 17 seasons, and now you're entering your last season at Temple. What is it about basketball in Philadelphia, but in particular, the Big Five that's so special? Well, I appreciate you telling, asked, telling the folks that I was a star player. I, I don't think I was much of a star, but I, I loved every second of being a college basketball player. I've loved every second of being a college basketball coach. And to have the opportunity to do it in Philadelphia has been amazing. Uh, <clears throat> I think Philadelphia is special in that the college basketball community is seen as part of the fabric of the city. And <clears throat> the relationships that you forge with the other five Division I head basketball coaches in, uh, in Philadelphia, as well as all the Division II and three coaches and all the high school coaches, it, it's pretty remarkable. And I think I give great credit to those people who came before us uh, in the mid-50s where they were part of putting the Big Five together. The reality is, Zach, I don't think you could, you, if you were another major metropolitan area, if, let's take Chicago, for example, that probably has five or six Division I schools within its scope, uh, would try to do this. I don't think it, it can be done. It just college basketball has changed dramatically. That being said, when the originators put this together, they all hung out together. They were all great friends. The, the spirit of competition was just what it is. It was a sportsmanship, a competitive piece. And now I think we maintain that sportsmanship and we certainly maintain the competitive piece to it. Uh, but it's, it's a different world that we live in. But I, I get, when you join the, the big five ranks, you do what everybody before you did and you respectfully uh, participate against each other. And it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that we have in Philadelphia. You, you are a player, you're also a coach, you've experienced many highs, many lows. Is there any memorable experience from either your playing days or your coaching days that have shaped your coaching philosophy? Yeah, probably a little bit. I, you know, from my playing days at LaSalle, we had a, a phenomenal, uh, in my junior year, we had a phenomenal game against Villanova. We were both in the top 10 in the country. Uh, we had some really good players on our team. Uh, Villanova had some really good players on their team said the two guys that probably were talked about the most were <coughs> Kenny Durrett, who played at LaSalle with me, and Howard Porter, who played uh, at Villanova. As a matter of fact, I have their pictures up top here uh, in, in that frame. So uh, it, it was an amazing opportunity, and you just you, it galvanized you as, as saying, you know what, especially in the city of Philadelphia, to have this great competitive spirit going on, but great respect for each other as well. Uh, interestingly enough, my high school basketball coach was an assistant coach at Villanova in those years as well. So it was a, it was an unbelievable opportunity for me to study college basketball even even in a, to a greater extent and just see what the, the value of competition was. Also, I'll go back to when I was at Penn. Actually, I had a we had a game against the, our arch rival in the league, the Ivy League, Princeton, and we had a a. Uh, great game we had a huge lead and we lost that lead and lost the game and, and uh, I went in and I would have sold my soul to the devil had we gotten two more extra points but I couldn't and I didn't but that same team who <clears throat> overcame that adversity of that huge loss won the Ivy League that year and we went to the NCAA tournament so uh, it's one of those things that, that shapes you like you're going to have some adversity uh, but you can't stay down you have to move on to the next play the next game opportunity and so I think it shaped me greatly I, I at the time I would have traded anything for two more points now I, I value that that loss is something that uh, helped me as a
grow as a person. Now let's let's keep on moving, moving on past that. Now going from the basketball court to the classroom, if I'm not mistaken, you're one of the only Division I coaches that actually teaches at the university that, that you coach at. Why did you decide to teach, and how do you manage that since both are very time consuming? Well, first of all, I did it at the University of Pennsylvania for seven fall semesters, and it should, ironically enough today, that's where I'm returning from class now. Do you grade when you get upset or when you go after a loss? Say that again. Do you grade after a loss? I don't do much of the grading. I do it in conjunction with a full professor here uh, by the name of Lynn Anderson here. And she's a wonderful person, a great teacher. She does all of that kind of thing. I kind of stand up a couple hours, a couple times a class, uh, pontificate on something that I think I know something about, and uh, and hopefully that the, the students learn from it. But I will tell you, I just mentioned it to them this morning that I I, I get way more out of it. I think they do. I just am so appreciative of having the opportunity to be in the classroom. I would ask uh, many of my fellow coaches to do the same. I think it gives you a different perspective of the university, of the flavor <coughs> of the daily life that these uh, young people go through. And, and again, I learned so much from it. Uh, but uh, it's not as time consuming uh, because I have somebody uh, who I'm doing it with. And um, so I, I do stay up on all the readings. I do do my work late at night, and uh, I'm grateful for it and uh, try to add something to the class. But it's been a wonderful experience for me. I would recommend that all my fellow coaches do something. Coaches, similar. listen. I, I hope you guys are watching this. But coach, good coaches impact players on the court, off the court. Great coaches shave their mustaches for their players. You, there's a picture right over there from the, from the Philadelphia Inquirer. You shaved your mustache for a player who graduated. Tell us about your relationship with Deontay Christmas and why did you decide to shave after four decades of having it? Well, I, I decided to shave it because I have a big mouth and I opened my mouth and I had to keep my word. But uh, Deontay left Temple in 2009. He had one course left to finish. Uh, and he tried to be an NBA basketball player, which I was grateful for. I, I, thought, it, I thought he should have been in the NBA and uh, eventually got there. But... Uh, he didn't finish the one class in, his, in that 2009 year, and then the next year he came back and he, and he, he didn't, I saw him and he didn't do it again, and I said, listen, I, I, I can't have this, this is not good, you need to, you need to finish this degree, and it's, you'll be the first one in your family, and I think it's really, really important, it makes a great statement, so I said, as a matter of fact, if you finish that degree, I will shave this mustache, which I've had for 40 years, and, and gladly do it, and uh, so he didn't finish it again that summer of 2010. He came around the next year, and I said, I, "You know, I, I don't know what to tell you. We're not. I don't. I'm struggling with this relationship that we have." And so I didn't see him throughout the whole summer. And finally, at the end of, uh, through the middle of August, actually, I got a text message from Deontay, and it said, "Coach, get your razor ready." He had, unbeknownst to me, finished the class that he needed to graduate. And uh, we made a big deal out of it. We had a press conference. And during the press conference, as I'm shaving, I'm, I'm also looking at him who was standing there and filming it for me. Uh, I said, you know, we're making this about me and my mustache. This story is really about Deontay Christmas and being the first one in his family to, to uh, get a degree. And he deserves this opportunity. He deserves to be in the NBA. And then shortly thereafter, made the uh, Phoenix Suns roster and stayed with them for a year. And, so it's a great story that, uh, that that he made it. He made it in so many different ways. But he's a really good guy. He's a really good basketball player, and, uh, and, uh, and he's a really good friend, and I'm appreciative of it. Yeah. Coaches versus Cancer in Philadelphia is, with the City Six Schools is an organization that you're very passionate about and you devote a lot of time to. Yeah. How did you get involved with Coaches versus Cancer? And after your coaching days, do you foresee yourself taking on a larger role in the organization? Uh, well, we first got involved uh, as a coaches group in the city of Philadelphia because it started in 1993, and as of 1996, we weren't really doing much with the organization. So actually, Coach Martelli and I talked for a little bit, and we decided to have a breakfast of which we had probably 50 people tops, uh, and then that started to grow, and then we had a gala, and then we had a golf tournament, and then we had... Uh, a luncheon. So we've had a number of different things that we've added over the years. Uh, it's a wonderful organization. It's the organization, the charity of choice for our coaches group uh, nationally. Uh, 
so we both are very, very highly involved, and the other the other guys get involved as well. And so uh, we have now got ourselves to raising the most money throughout the, the country, but we should because we're Philadelphia and because we're one of, we're one of six coaches who are getting their uh, their thrust behind us and hopefully making a difference. Uh, I, I do whatever they ask me to do, and I'll do that for a lot of charities that are out there, which I, I do a, a number of things these days as well. I think it comes with the job. It's part and parcel of the job that we have. We're given these great opportunities uh, as college basketball coaches in Philly, and I think it's important for us to give back in some way, shape, or form. I'd like you to give back. In of course, how can, how, can a, how can a young person like me get involved in such I, I think talking about it, maybe devoting, you know, you're talking about it now with this, this show that you have, so just talk about it and, and get behind the cause. And you'll get, and there's plenty of good causes out there. You'll get behind something, Zach, because that's the kind of human being you are, and you'll make a difference, and that's what you want to try to do. That's, that's, that's the goal, that's the plan, Coach. As I mentioned to you before, before I started recording, we're going to do something brand new on Zach on Sports, Little Word Association, a quick little, a quick little lightning round. I'm going to say a phrase or, or a person and just say the first thing that comes into mind, all right? Yes, sir. Phil Martelli. A character. Good guy. Interviewed him on Zach on Sports. Check, He's a good check man those and a good out. Friend, so. Yes. Cheesesteaks. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm partial to cheesesteaks. I love them. Uh, probably eat too many during the course of a year. I'm trying to cut back a little bit, but uh, it's, it's a delightful food. Is it Pat or Gino's? Uh, you know, I, I, when, I, when people ask me that same question, I say you need to go to Pat's and Gino's with a friend, go to both places, cut it in half, and make your own decision as to what you like. John Cheney. Uh A great man, great friend, uh, great mentor, and somebody that I value and have friendship with dramatically. Yeah, now you have to be a little bit careful about this one. Tom Brady. <laughs> <laughs> I love Tom Brady. He's a good man. Okay. <laughs> and and finally, Fran Bunty. Uh, I, I don't really like talking about myself too much, and I, I think I'm a, a, an interesting study. You know, I, I think I try to be the best person I can be. I'm sure I've made many mistakes over the course of my life. Hopefully I'm a good friend, hopefully I'm a good husband and a good father and, uh, and somebody that cares about others. And, and finally, I appreciate it. Uh, great person, took time out of your, out of your busy schedule to, to do this interview, so I, I really appreciate it. Coach? All right, thank you. Thanks, but good luck with this endeavor that you had thank too. You. I hope you hit a home, home run for sure. I, I hope so. Let's see, go out of the park. But everyone else, I'll see you guys next time on Zach on Sports.